Welcome to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. In this podcast, financial planner Peter Raskin helps families and business owners understand and prepare for their wealth journey. Along the way, thoughtful and detailed planning can provide clarity and confidence as clients confront a multitude of financial decisions. Listen in as Peter shares stories and insight into people's wealth journeys. Now, let's get into today's podcast. Hello and welcome to Wealth is in the Details with Peter Raskin from Raskin Planning Group. I'm extremely excited because today Peter has a special guest on the show, and that is Jasper White, who's a retired chef and restaurateur. Peter, why'd you bring Jasper on the show today? Uh, Great question, uh, Eric, and I am so thrilled that Jasper has has joined us today. I've known Jasper for many years, and he's become a a friend, and I just he's always got interesting things to tell us and uh so i'm i'm really really excited that he's here so jasper thanks for thanks so much for for joining us today sure, really appreciate I'm happy it to be here yeah so let me just uh, uh, for those listeners that that may not know jasper uh he's a, a really well-known chef in the boston area he's been uh working as a as a as a as a chef uh since 1973 uh one of his uh first uh, restaurant was uh, Jasper's restaurant, which was uh, one of uh, one of Boston's most wonderful uh, restaurants right on the uh, 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 on the historic waterfront. And then he he ran that for uh, about 14 years, I believe. And uh, then uh, soon soon thereafter, uh, opened up a, a restaurant called Summer Shack, which is was very, very different than um, Jasper's. And but uh, just b- both restaurants were wonderful. Uh, Jasper has been a uh, a James Beard Chef of the Year in the Northeast and and won many many awards, written books, uh, and just is a, a great business owner as well. And so I I thought it'd be just a fantastic guest for us today. So again, thanks Jasper. Uh, but welcome. before we begin, um, I just want to recognize the, the 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 reality that we're in today which is that there are millions of restaurant and and entertainment workers and businesses that have been really affected by this pandemic. And I I know it's devastating to to many individuals and families. And 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 these are hardworking people that have done everything right. And due to really no fault of their own, their worlds have been turned upside down. And I just think it's heart wrenching to to think about it. Uh, and, And Jasper, this must be so hard for you. I'm sure it feels super personal and, you know, this is like family, I'm sure. So so what are you thinking about during this time? Well, it is like family. And, uh, you know, on one hand, I sold my businesses. I finally got out. It was a slow process. But over the last uh, about eight years ago, I started kind of preparing to retire and sold a couple restaurants piecemeal, uh, sold my seafood company that I had and got paid actually for ended up selling everything and getting paid and uh so i have mixed emotions because i'm a lucky one i i I don't have to go through the pandemic but my heart is broken for uh for my friends in the business and for and especially for the workers who uh many have they don't have any other options other than restaurant work and they're they're in big trouble uh, and, and I feel like, although it's through no fault of our own, I think that that we've been let down in a big way, and that we have lessons to learn from the from this COVID virus. I mean, we employ as independent restaurant tours more than 12 million workers in America, four times what the airlines uh, employ, and do we get a dime? No, not a dime. Not a dime. The PPE or whatever it was called was, uh, you know, it, it all went to the chains. And basically, the U.S. government made a decision to let restaurants suffer and go out of business. And that's the only way I can frame it, because it, it, it's just so wrong. But it also shows that when you have uh, millions of independent uh, businesses, they have no clout. I mean, we're so busy competing with each other that we, we never got together. 
And so we have no voice, we have no lobby, we have nothing we can do other than sit and suffer. And so my heart is broken for uh, for a lot of restaurateurs. The older ones like me, I mean, the restaurant business is a cash flow business. So we don't leave a lot of money in the business. So the older restaurateurs, you know, even if their restaurants fail, they'll be okay. But I'm thinking of myself if uh, when I opened my first business and the amount of work, the the 12, 14 hours a day, not having enough money to to pay the bills and, you know, having to make night deposits and all the things that you go through to to open a business and, and to see these young, younger restaurateurs uh, who maybe have a restaurant that's been open a year, maybe two years and, and to watch them failing left and right is very painful and uh, oh, yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah, it's just affected so many people, uh, not just the business owners, but the employees. It's really it's been so hard to watch. And yeah, and it's it's going to affect everybody because, you know, we it's independent restaurants, not the chains that we hold the community t together. You go to any charity event and you'll see the independent restaurants supporting whatever it is. And, you know, take a neighborhood like the South End of Boston. Who was the first one in there? Who, re who re revitalized South, uh, the South End? It, it wasn't the landlords that were buying the brownstones up. It was Gordon Hammersley and the restaurateurs that went into that neighborhood. I mean, I went into Alewife Station 20 years ago. People said I was crazy. And look at it today. Condos. I mean, everything. So restaurants are trail independent restaurateurs because of our financial restraints, we're trailblazers. We have to take the cheaper spaces because we can't compete with the, uh, with the chains. And so it's a loss for, for the community in general to lose these restaurants is, is a major loss. And, yeah, and a loss for all of us. It just it really of, of is. Of course. I mean, when, when, you know, when you have that uh, ornery grandmother that nobody wants to see, where do you go? You go to the restaurant. You want to get engaged? <laughs> you go to the restaurant. You know, you want to close a billion dollar business deal? You go to a restaurant. I mean, we, we serve the public like no other industry. And yet, here we are. Yeah. Dying. It's, it's dying. Very, very sad. Yeah. So, so so let's let's um shift gears a bit and and really lighten talk, it up talk, a little. <laughs> yeah, it's a little. Let's talk about uh, your career and and so when when you started, what were you thinking? Did did you have a vision? Did did you know what you wanted? No, I didn't. I'm just like any other kid that you know. I I uh, I, I kind of fell into it, and I was uh, part of the hippie generation in the '60s and '70s, and. Uh, in the restaurant business, uh, I mean, I should start by saying my career started uh, the first time that I was able to analyze my uh, Italian grandmother's cooking. Hmm. I just, it, 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 it affected me uh, more than it would uh, normal people or other people. And I had always been obsessed with food, with textures, with flavors, with aromas. And so... I loved loved food. I didn't know I wanted to be a chef. I just knew how much I loved food. And I don't want to make it a long story, but I ended up uh, cooking in a hotel for uh, because I needed some money. And I got a job as a breakfast cook. That was 1972, I think, or 73. I was paid two sixty five an hour. Uh, I met the first uh, gay couple I've ever met. Uh, I had we had a dishwasher that used to try to drown himself in the sink every every time he ran out of pots and pans to cook. We I worked with a mixture of people from all different races and uh, uh, sexual preferences. And you know when I when I left that job, I, I didn't think I wanted to be a chef when I started. But when I left that job, I th said to myself, I found my people. I mean, this is a, an environment where. It's all about the food. It's not about what you do after work, or what you believe in, uh, what your politics are. It's just about making great food. And that's what I loved about it. And that, that was the start of my career. And, and who, who were your mentors? Was, was your grandmother a, a mentor? Uh, and, and who else kind of led you along and, and, and taught well, you and really helped you? My, my great grandfather uh, came from Farentino 
Uh, it's uh, in Lazio, outside of Rome. And they emigrated here in 1903. And he was a well-known chef in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and so my grandmother kind of always was saying, you know, someday you might be a great chef. Someday you might be a great chef. And I never really took it that seriously. But it was the seed was planted. On the other hand, my other grandmother was from Ireland. So uh, I only have one grandparent that was born in the United States. And uh, she wanted me to become the first American pope, which didn't happen. <laughs> uh, I, I won't ask why. <laughs> well, because she was a charismatic Catholic and uh, she, there was no higher calling on, on the planet. And sure. that's what she wanted for me. So uh, I went with my Italian grandmother's one. Uh -huh. my, my mentors, I've had many mentors. Um, the first ones I'll mention all have French names because they were all French. René Panon, uh, Yves Lanzac, and Alphonse Tomas. They were three chefs I worked with early in my career after I got out of culinary school one on the East Coast and two, one in California, one in Seattle. And also uh, one of my co-workers, Lydia Shire, who uh, actually worked for me theoretically, but not, not in reality. Uh, the most, one of the most exciting, brave women, fearless chefs that I've ever come in contact with. And she was a pure inspiration to me. And I actually consider her, even though she worked for me, <laughs> I consider her a mentor. I've had many mentors because I've had mentors in business too. And it's what we do. I mean, it's the only, it's the only way that uh, an industry that, that really is kind of un, unregulated and un, you know, like we don't have, uh, we, we do have school now, but it's not a necessity. And so, yeah, I think uh, mentorship is, is the backbone of the restaurant industry. Well, you, you you need a team to uh, to do anything that's 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 interesting and positive and 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 and, and because of that, you got to help each other. And so, mentorship yeah. is probably something that's natural in, in your industry. And, and so, complete, yeah, completely go ahead, integral. Jasper. It's completely integral to the restaurant business. You know, we 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 grow we grow our own people, and uh, you know, we take a lot of satisfaction out of that. And just just curious, what do you think makes a good mentor? And also, which to me is just as important, what what makes a good mentee? Well, a good mentor, it's it starts with caring and, and, and actually being able to get true satisfaction and pleasure out of watching other people achieve their goals and accomplish their goals. I think if it's not genuine, it's hard to be a good mentor. I mean, I think you really have to enjoy the process and 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 take uh, satisfaction and pride uh, of watching other people accomplish their goals. And mm -hmm. what makes a good mentee in the kitchen? Humility, period. Do what you're told, listen to the chef, uh, stay humble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I think I think those two those uh, those descriptions of being a good mentor and a good mentee apply to so much of, of life. You know, it, it, I think we all need help. We all have needed assistance. We, we've all needed someone to look up to uh, that we can look up to uh, in our in our world. And I think it's just vital. It, it, it makes for it makes it fun. Yeah, it does. And, and also it's it, it, it's not just someone to look up on. It's someone that you that you think really cares about you. Yeah. You know, that's that's what really matters. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Jasper, there's there's certainly a lot of great cooks, a lot of great chefs. Uh, mm -hmm. But what what made you successful? You know, and, and and as you look back, what what was most important to your success? Well, I think there's so many uh, so many factors. I mean, uh, one of them was that I was obsessed with what I did uh, to you know to the point where. You know, I have uh, right now I, uh, my bookshelf, there's 800 cookbooks and I've read every one of them. And so, you know, loving what you do is is really the key to success, I think. But it's also uh, being creative, which comes from, you know, thinking about it all the time and what what can you make different? And which is why I've read so many different books, just 
if I get one idea from a book, it, it's worth the price of the book. And then I think that I'm a natural leader because I was uh, the firstborn of four children in my family. And uh, there was a point when I was 14 where I was the head of my household. I'm not going to go into that. But I, I take uh, leadership as a responsibility to the people that you're leading. And um, I think, uh, I'm trying to think what made me successful. Luck. I had some luck. I had some really uh, good timing, like, like I mentioned in the beginning. I sold my restaurants before this pandemic. That's just luck. That's good timing. And I had a lot of that. I, I reached a point in my career where I was frustrated. Uh, all I, uh, the first eight years of my career, all I cooked was French food. And uh, one, I had one job cooking Italian food. And yet I had reached a point where I, I understood that no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to be French. And there were, uh, there were kind of rumblings going around on the West Coast about uh, California cooking, California cuisine, Alice Waters, Jeremiah Tower, and then uh, in New York, Larry Forgione doing a, a, a place called American Place. And it was the first time that I had a glimpse that it's possible that fine dining doesn't have to be French that there could be new venues to, to go into fine dining. And, and so I started uh, doing dishes at the Bostonian Hotel especially, but even at Parker's we started doing uh, more creative stuff and getting away from the classic restaurant dishes. And at the Bostonian Hotel we did an American uh, we did an American menu printed in English and it just happened to be 1982. And it was the beginning of a huge wave that changed American cuisine forever. Um, and I was just lucky enough to be one of the chefs of probably 50 or 60 across the country that was, uh, that was changing uh, what fine dining was in America. And I, I have to say, before, before that time, fine dining in America was French. That was it. Everything else was in the second tier. And when I when I opened Jasper's, a fine dining American restaurant focused on New England and New England seafood, and and the, we did the same thing at the Bostonian Hotel. When when those opened, it was there was a pent up desire for something new on the marketplace. And America, you know, Wolfgang Puck, all around the country, Americans embraced this new American cuisine. And in turn, I feel like that, that movement, which started with American food, when I opened Jasper's on the waterfront, it was the first fine dining restaurant in Boston that wasn't French or pretending to be French. And within a year, Sally Ling's opened, first fine dining Chinese restaurant in Boston. Uh, right after that, uh, Steve DiFilippo opened Dabio's on, and we're, so we had three restaurants, a fine dining Italian restaurants. We had three fine dining restaurants on Atlantic Ave. Not one of them was French. Hmm. So one, one of time. the things that, one, one of the things that, that you did, you, you, you were creative, you, and you took risks. Yes. Yeah. Because I had nothing to lose. Right. <laughs> when I opened my first rest, when I opened my first restaurant, I, I would have never uh, had it open if it wasn't for a banker named Jack Seidel, who was the president of the U.S. Trust, who loved my food from the Bostonian. And uh, I had never had a car loan. I was 29 years old. I had never had a car loan. I never had a credit card. And he loaned me uh, uh, he loaned me enough money to open my first restaurant, which it, today is small money. It was. Uh, uh, $250,000, but it was all I needed to get started. Interesting. When you look back at it, what, what have been your, what were your biggest challenges as a business owner? Not necessarily just as a chef, but, but as a business owner, because you, you, that's one of the things you did is you ran a business. I did run a business. And, uh, I think that that, that question, I, I mean, we could, we could sit down and talk for hours. We could just talk about, uh, the the frustrations of you know dealing with all the nonsense with the that that comes along with the business with you know the government and all the the, the uh, you know we we deal with three three governments um, we deal with uh, city state and federal 
that's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. And uh, it, it can be really frustrating times. Peter, what was the original question? So what were what were these big challenges? Oh, so the the the, the, the biggest challenge, I mean, it changed as my life changed. And, you know, the biggest challenge in the beginning was cash flow. You know, I opened the, my first restaurant and uh, had to borrow money to make my first payroll. And, you know, I used to write write the checks out and I didn't mail them. Whenever I got a bill, I would pay it, but I didn't mail it until I had the money in the bank. I used to have to do night deposits down on the waterfront, which wasn't, you know, the waterfront in 1983 wasn't that great. And so cash flow uh, was the biggest challenge to starting the new business. And, you know, we touched on that in the beginning about that, why my empathy goes to these young restaurateurs that are just starting. The people part of it, that's the biggest part is building a great team and finding great people. There were some disappointments along the way and managing people that uh, didn't have their heart in it. But uh, uh, the real challenge to me, the, the real joy of it was also was that part of it. In the restaurant business, we, we're unlike any, any other business. We are manufacturers and we are sales and we are service. We do it all from, you know, we buy a raw product and, and we collect the final money on it. And in that process, there's so many things that can go wrong. Just the equipment that it takes to run a commercial kitchen, there's always things breaking and you're always working around small problems or power losses or a hot water heater that bursts or you know any number of little problems and uh, and then i find that in the beginning for me it was it, i had a tough time dealing with uh, unhappy customers it wasn't something i was good at and over time i i learned that and not that i had that many un unhappy customers but you can have, uh, you know, 100 people come into your restaurant and the one person, 99 loved it, and the one person who hated it ruins your night. What I learned over time was to expect that person. And so w when, when that would happen, when there'd be whatever I had to deal with, I'd say to myself before I started talking to them, hi, I've been expecting you. <laughs> because <laughs> you've, when you serve the general public, you need to expect it. And, right. Uh, uh, so, so many challenges. And then I went from having one restaurant uh, that I did for 12 years. And I, I, I want to say this before we go any further. My uh, idea of running a business, this is, this is going to probably not sit well with some people, but I, I don't believe, I, I never believed that my goal was to make money. I always believed that my goal was to make great food, to give great service, and to make people happy, and that money was the reward, not the goal. Well, uh, Jasper, what was your your saying with Summer Shack? What 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 did ha, ha, what uh, was food you? is love? There you go. That says food it all. Food is love, and and I truly believe that. I think, you know, I could go on and on. I could uh, I could uh, just take one one food item, and a peach, let's say, and I can tell you that that peach that you're eating is not just a peach. It, it holds the history of the universe. There's hundreds and thousands of people that uh, and animals that that found this wild, you know, that liked this wild fruit, took a liking to it, uh, figured out how to make it better, and then the farmers that grow it, the truckers that ship it, the people in the store that sell it. There's just, there's so much that goes into it. And it's so, to me, almost sacred, the ingredients that we use. And so, yeah, that's how I think about that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Food is love. I, I, love. I love that. And, and, and uh, it, worked, it worked for me. I, I, I was a good businessman. I, I, I've had a couple failures in my career, but they weren't terrible failures. I never... Uh, I never had to declare bankruptcy. I closed two businesses, paid every employee, paid every purveyor, and uh, you know lost money, but uh, never had a bankruptcy. 
Yeah, and that's so that's wonderful. I, I think I was pretty got pretty good at it for a guy who I didn't go to business school. I went to culinary <laughs> school. <laughs> yeah, but so, you you had a, you had a vision that you'd make people happy and uh, yeah, and you worked think, hard. And I think a lot of the not all businesses, but a lot of uh, successful businesses, they, they, they're they successful because there's an honesty and there's uh, an integrity and there is a true authenticity to the product that they make and a true connection between the person who makes it and the per and that that's what makes things really successful, I think. Yeah, interesting. Well, J Jasper, I, I have uh, this next part of the conversation, uh, I'd like to talk about your thoughts about um, the recent past, meaning pre-COVID. And, mm -hmm. and then I'd like you also to comment um, about the future, at least g give us your your feelings about where the restaurant business is is, is headed. It, it, as we're looking back, you, you recently told me that, um, that pre-COVID, uh, the restaurant business was broken. And, and so what, is, what did you mean by that? Well, I don't mean it was completely broken, but I, I think it was, I think to a large extent, uh, let's just start with the, with the sheer numbers. Pre-COVID, almost half of the restaurants that open go out of business in two years. And we're talking about independent restaurants, not chain restaurants, which is, uh, that's a whole nother, a whole nother ball game. And, uh, I, I think that there, we were having severe labor shortage before COVID, and the business model is outdated. It doesn't it doesn't provide enough profit for the business, and there's a lot there is a lot of factors that go into that. First of all, uh, the business model in America, uh, if you look at the chain restaurants. It's like the same menu everywhere. It's like America has one menu. It's chicken wings, Caesar salad, pizza, uh, burgers, blah, blah, blah. It's, just, it's like the same, it's the same menu everywhere. And uh, there's an expectation that restaurants have to have something for everybody to enjoy. And that's not a good expectation anymore. That that doesn't work. And the the chains created it. They forced independence into trying to compete with them at that level. And you know, let's face it, you you can't be great and do and be everything to everybody. Another problem, and I'll talk about it when I talk about what the new restaurant I think should look like. But another problem, there's an inequity in our business in terms of. Uh, the pay that goes to the back of the house, to the dishwashers, the cooks. I, I've had situations, for example, my restaurant uh, at Mohegan Sun, where bartenders make more in, in one night than the cook makes in a week. And that's a big concern. And it, it, it always was a concern for me. And so at the same time, at the exact same time, our labor costs are driving, we have a higher labor costs than almost any other industry because we're our manufacturers. We make things from scratch. And so the, the, the juxtaposition of underpaid staff and high labor costs, to me, that's broken. Does that make sense to you? It sure does. Yeah, underpaid, underpaid staff with a labor cost that's too high to, to you know, to be a business model that truly works. Yeah. Most restaurants, if they make 10% profit, they're brilliant, okay? There are exceptions, and I've had exceptions myself, but they're exceptions. But the average restaurant for the small independent restaurants, it, they're, not, they're hardly a business the way they're run and in the, in the way the expectations are. They're, it's more like a job that you can't get fired from when you open your own little restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so, that that business model is uh, has got to change, and you know maybe COVID is a is a time that that can happen. And I w one of the big regrets in my career is that I didn't work harder on this. 
I, I paid better than anybody in town because I am a, a cook at heart. I've always been a cook, and I know how valuable they are, and a, a good cook is worth their weight in gold. And um, a bad cook can cost you a lot of money and, and money that you don't know you're losing because, the, because people aren't coming back to your restaurant. And so I, I wish I had done more. Uh, I wish I could see it as clearly then as I do now that I've had a couple of years away from it. But that has to change in the future. The price of entry into the restaurant business today is ridiculous. And it's because of the chain restaurants that every space in America, doesn't matter where it is, is, is worth what Starbucks will pay for it, you know? And they'll pay a lot. And so Wall Street is ruining American restaurants. It's ruining the food scene in America. And it, it, needs, to, uh, it needs to be attacked from, with a new kind of restaurant because, and it, it needs a new type of thinking. But before I say that, I wanna say uh, one other thing, that restaurants are social gathering places. Well, what if you had, uh, what if you had a supermarket and that became a social gathering place where people spent hours and you couldn't get enough people to come and go to make your business work? And so I think that part of the business is that people feel like they can sit for two and a half, three hours in a restaurant, but they're not paying for it. That if they're taking up a ta a, a, enough time that they could have served two people, that that has to stop too. And so I don't, I'm not saying people shouldn't shouldn't use restaurants as social gathering places, but the point blank concept of a restaurant as a social gathering place, it doesn't work financially unless it's very high end. And that's where that, that's where that belongs. But in terms of medium price restaurants or, or cheap eat type places, you need to stay as long as, you know, you need to stay the amount of time uh, that makes it worthwhile for the restaurant to have you there. Yeah, they've got you've got to have seatings. You have to have people coming in and out. Exactly. Yeah. So here's a business model that I think could be successful in the future. And I, I don't I don't think it'll all happen right away. But I'm going to say that uh, anybody who's been to Japan and has observed their restaurant scene there in the city of Tokyo, there's not one restaurant with more than 50 seats. Maybe there is, and I don't know about it, but all the restaurants basically seat between 10 and 40 people, period. Uh, they don't have a menu that does everything. Most restaurants have one or two things that they do better than anybody else, which is why they're still in business. And it takes a cook Let's take clam chowder, for instance. I can make, uh, I can make 10 gallons of clam chowder. Uh, it, it would take me a half hour longer than making one gallon, okay, in a professional kitchen. And so what has to, I think what has to happen is restaurants need to get smaller. They need to specialize and do a couple things really well. In fact, they have to do it so well that people will come despite anything else. You know, they'll come because they tasted it and they can't live without getting another taste of it in the future. And I've actually had, like, uh, in my first restaurant, I did oysters and oysters with caviar. I had a salad with uh, duck that was really popular. And I had a, a, my pan-roasted lobster. Those three items on my menu were more than 50% of the sales but they were only about 10% of the labor. And so, you know, and I didn't, I never didn't think of it either, you know, but I think if I was going to, which I'm not going to open an, a new restaurant, I would come up with a few things that are so fabulous that people just, they can't not come back. They have to come have it. And I would have a very limited menu in a small space that was always packed and people would, would come and go, you know, come and go. Come eat a relaxed meal with a smaller menu. It's not, you're not waiting a half hour for your food and make the whole experience faster and better. 
I think that's it. It, it has to happen. It, it has to change. Do you, Do you see a um, uh, a, a place for uh, the fine dining establishments as well? Oh, absolutely. No, no question about it. In fact, I think the high end is uh, the safest place to be. For example, uh, there was a very big recession in 1988. Do you remember that? I do. 88, 88. Guess what? I didn't even know they had a recession. I was so busy at Jasper's, which was very expensive, the most expensive restaurant in town. I was so busy, I didn't even know there was a recession until somebody told me about it. And so, you know, if you have 10 million and you lose five, you can still afford a really nice dinner. So the, the high end of the restaurant market is a good place to be, but you have to be really good. You have to, you know, you have to make it uh, an experience that's unforgettable to do that. So I think, um, I think it's exa- the high end, running a high end restaurant is exhausting because there's it, it, so much attention to every single detail and no room for mistakes, not when people are spending as much money as, as that. And so, so, so I, the, think, I think it's a good spot. I think it's high end will, will, will do well. But a, a 150 seat high end restaurant, a 100 seat high end restaurant, it's just asking for trouble. And rents, rents are a big issue. Rent is a huge issue. You know, you sign these leases and it, it looks good the first year and you think, you know, you think you're going to keep up with inflation, but it never happens. I don't know one restaurant that doubled their volume as the rent doubled over time. It doesn't sure. work that way. And so, yeah, I, I think I think that a lot of landlords will become humbled by this by this uh, thing. And I, I don't believe the fallout is even close to happening. I mean, we're talking about you know, June, July, before we have herd immunity and uh, before things really go back to normal. And, and uh, right now, they're on the restaurants are on the brink right now. Many, many, sure. many restaurants. They're not going to make it through the winter. And there's going to be a lot of empty spaces. I mean, now I forgot the number, but it was an astounding amount of number in the hundreds of thousands. I, it might be close to 200,000 restaurants that have already closed across the country. But I don't think we're halfway there, Peter. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, you, so in the future, you see a smaller footprint, fewer seats to tables. You see higher, a higher turnover. You see more parity uh, amongst uh, the back and the front. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, I think truly the 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 real answer that has to happen is is to uh, uh, abolish tipping. Hmm. I, I think it's I, I for one, I don't think that that the service in America, it, it suffered greatly over the years. The whole generation of European waiters that used to come to America and work, they're not here. Uh, the AIDS epidemic in the 80s killed off so many, so many, so many uh, professional uh, people in the service industry. Uh, it was devastating. And no one's really ever t- uh, talked about the, how much damage was done. But people don't just learn from their bosses. They learn from each other. They learn by example. They learn by working with other great workers. And we lost a lot of great workers in our industry because of AIDS. Yeah. And uh, I don't think service has ever recovered. I don't think that most waiters deserve to make the money. I hate to say it, but I don't think they deserve the money they make. Most of them, they're not working any harder than the cooks. And uh, it, yeah, it takes it t- does take some personality. Not everybody can do it. They deserve to make good money, fair money. But do they deserve to make five times more than the people that are making the food? I don't think so. Yeah, that it's we'll see we'll see what uh, what transpires over the next uh, twelve to twenty four months because I think it's going to take a long time for us to get back uh, into any sort of sense of normalcy if we do. So. Um, yeah, and I think I think this is an opportunity maybe for a lower entry fee into the business because it's really, you know, uh, I had a, a, a wonderful accountant named Lenny Pape, and he, he was my first accountant when I went to get my, my bank loans before I found the banker that finally gave me a loan. I got turned down by every bank in Boston, and I remember I made an appointment at Liberty Bank. It was my first appointment, and he said, bring in a pro forma. And I didn't know what a pro forma was. 
And so uh, I had worked with a, a woman named Mar Margie Pape, and uh, she worked at the Copley Plaza with me. And I called her because I, I knew her husband was the accountant. And I said, "You think uh, you think your husband could come uh, help me do a pro forma?" And she said, "I'll I'll put him in touch with you." And so I talked to Lenny, and he did a pro forma for me. And when I, I I told him I would pay him, he said, "No, you don't have to pay me. Just make me your accountant." And he was my accountant until he retired. And he told me early on, Jasper, debt is the enemy. Debt is the enemy. Debt is the enemy. And that's always been my uh, mantra in business is to have no debt and in life, too. I, I've, I, I mean, I use credit cards, but I've never, never used them the way most people use them. I just pay them when the bill comes in. I get the cash flow, but not the thing. And so I think that... Uh, it's a really important thing to understand how, how consuming debt is in business. And absolutely, when you open a business, you know, the amount of debt, this is why so many restaurants fail in the beginning, because they don't have they don't have the capital for, you know, to get through that first year or, or the first. They're not financially healthy enough to make it through a tough time, whereas uh, a restaurant that's backed by a big chain it can have a rough year. It can have a couple, uh, a slow start. In the end, they know they're going to be okay. And so there needs to be a lower price of entry. And I think that maybe this, unfortunately, because uh, so many people have been hurt by the, so many restaurateurs have been hurt by this, it, it, there's no denying that there's going to be some uh, opportunities and maybe opportunities for a lower price of entry. And maybe uh, a clientele that uh, has changed a lot by being at home a lot. And I, I don't know, I, I feel like if there's ever going to be a change in the industry, we have a perfect time because most people haven't been eating in restaurants, they've been eating takeout. And, um, and I think it's a I think there's some real opportunity in the future for young uh, entrepreneurs. Oh, I hope so, Jasper. Hey, Jasper, this has been a wonderful talking with you. I, I just want to ask, uh, I know you're doing some writing. Uh, where can people buy your cookbooks now? Is that uh, is that uh, are they available for sale? Oh, yeah, they're on they're on Amazon. Um, they're not really, you know, you can actually get a copy of my first book, which is just turned uh, turned 30 years old the other day. <laughs> and so but Amazon has all four of my books. Um, oh great okay so if someone is interested they should yeah, go on amazon all, uh, and they're, they're not being reprinted by the publisher but they're still out there great well i look forward to uh to getting your your new book that you uh are, are working on at some point when you're finished so yeah thank you whenever i whenever i get finished in the meantime i'm just uh enjoying enjoying a quieter lifestyle and uh, uh truly truly i uh um so sad for america for what we've been through and not just for the restaurateurs but for everyone for uh, all business people and for all the people that have lost loved ones it's terrible. yeah i i feel the same way jasper well hey thank you again so much this has been wonderful and i uh, really really appreciate the conversation i know my listeners uh, uh are also going to really enjoy because you've always got good and interesting things to tell us so th thanks again really appreciate it all right, Peter, you take care. You too. And uh, thank you. All right, gentlemen, this was a fantastic podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Jasper, for your time today. Peter, of course, thank you for bringing him on the show. And I know that we all echo the sentiments that Jasper uh, expressed here. Um, I'm very much hopeful that we're going to get back on track very, very soon. Uh, and of course, listening audience, thank you for tuning in and listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast with Peter Raskin. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Peter comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Raskin Planning Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation. 
The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Peter Raskin is a registered representative of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Securities offered through Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker, dealer, member SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Sagemark Consulting, a division of Lincoln Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Insurance offered through Lincoln Affiliates and other fine companies. Raskin Planning Group is not an affiliate of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation and its representatives do not provide legal or tax advice. You may want to consult a legal or tax advisor regarding any legal or tax information as it relates to your personal circumstances.